Okay, we're at the Fraser Museum in downtown Louisville, where we're gonna see a presentation about three things that don't seem to have much to do with one another, but they actually do. Bourbon, beer, and bait casting. And the thing that they have in common is the state of Kentucky and the city of Frankfurt. So we're gonna head on in, we're gonna talk to the principal speakers tonight, have a little behind the scenes interviews, and then we're gonna see the presentation. I think it's something you'll enjoy. We're going on a journey. Honor tradition, embrace change. Brewer through all the time, bourbon only occasionally. Stream fishing constituted the pleasure and the perfection of bass angling. Like Daniel Boone said, heaven must be a Kentucky kind of place. I'm William Hickeybine, and we are at Fraser Museum and Event Space on Main Street in downtown Louisville, Kentucky. We're here tonight to talk about our new book that uh, Bill Hinkebein and I wrote together on early bass fishing in the Kentucky Reel. I'm Tim Lusher. I own Sig Lusher Brewery in Franklin, Kentucky, and we're at the Fraser Museum in Louisville. What beer and bourbon have in common? Yeast. The difference being is brewers brew all the time, bourbon only occasionally. So we provided the original yeast for each Taylor. My name is Freddie Johnson. Okay. Okay. This is going to be hard. Yeah. <laughs> you can smell the difference between the E.H. Taylor and the Blanton's. So Blanton's is known as a higher rye. Okay. So if you nose it and then you smell the Taylor, it's a little bit softer to the nose. When I graduated from Western Kentucky University in 1972, I started writing about the outdoors. Art Lander is the co-author. He's a gentleman that's been writing about outdoor fishing and hunting in Kentucky for probably maybe a hundred years. And he is a, an authority on the waters and and he's been writing articles for multiple magazines and publications about the Kentucky wildlife and fishing and hunting for so long that I had to meet him and incorporate him and his knowledge into this book. And he did a great job. A lot of people don't realize that the multiplying bait casting reels, they were made from about 1810 to 1948, that they were handmade bait casting reels and they were the first reel of that type and made in the entire United States. Kentucky is where I grew up and the longer I live here and meet people and read more about it, there's so many fascinating things about Kentucky. It was the first state west of the Appalachians when the people came over and they got in the bluegrass area. You gotta remember this is a rolling beautiful land, a savanna with giant trees and you know, openings. There was buffalo, there was deer, there was elk. The streams were full of fish. I mean, it was just heaven on earth. When the settlers received land grants for coming out here, the agreement was you could get 40 to 400 acres of land, but the commitment was you had to raise one acre of grain and ship it back east. And the settlers discovered they could actually ship more product in a liquid form. Whiskey was a, an excellent bartering tool, and the better the whiskey, the more money they could make in trade. It was easier to preserve it. You didn't have to worry about rodents getting into it, and you didn't have to worry about mold and mildew and stuff like that. And they could use the same casts that they had had their other products in, and we used those same casts to transport the whiskey. Bourbon and bait casting. It's the same water, these beautiful limestone, creeks with the limestone water that that not only allowed all these fabulous bass, pike, perch, and muskie to be so prevalent in the 39,000 miles of navigable waters in Kentucky. It's the same water that the distillers found perfect for distilling the bourbon. Some of the early streams that the fishermen fished on like Stoner Creek that flows through Paris, that's where 
Some of the very first bourbon in the entire state was distilled by Jacob Spears. And uh, of course, Paris is where the, the breeding, Paris and Lexington are where the thoroughbred breeding industries originated. And it all was happening at the same time. And kind of the Kentucky real story got kind of overshadowed a little bit. And then over the years, the bourbon titans all had fishing reels made by these great Kentucky craftsmen. And they fish these same waters. So there's definitely a connection with the bourbon and the horse industry. We had a lot of interesting reel makers. We had a lot, a lot of interesting owners of the reels. Tonight, we're gonna to talk about three of them. That's E.H. Taylor. He was known as a man of 100 suits. That he was kind of like the Barnum and Bailey of the whiskey industry because he had railroad tracks. He had trains that would go between all of his different distilleries. And on that car, on that train would be his box cars for his grain and his whiskey, but he also had a club car. And he would entertain politicians and other constituents between his different distilleries. So he could wheel and deal and uh, give them a nice meal, give them a nice drink of bourbon, and conduct business all at the same time. So he was, uh, he was a pretty smart guy. Sig and uh, E.H. were contemporaries, friends, comrades, and collaborators at the time. Uh, E.H. was on, was mayor for 16 years. Sig was a city commissioner at the same time. Uh, our history with E.H. and the Taylor family in general go back to the 1860s. And of course, George Stagg. Taylor was a visionary. Stagg was a realist. Uh, he was military. In our gallery that we have at the distillery, we have a picture of him in his uniform, and he was down to earth. So he was like, let's just cut the yes. stuff, and let's just start making good product. And Albert Blanton. Colonel Blanton, Albert Bacon Blanton, next visionary that comes through the distillery. Starts there while he was a kid, played around there with my granddad, but uh, starts to work at the age of 16. By the time he's 35, he's the president and CEO. These are three great distillers who made great products, were all avid fishermen, and had reels made for them that they used in these same waters. The reel was developed because the only previous reels were English made, or they were basically spools put on a tin contraption to retrieve line. But the early craftsmen were watchmakers, silversmiths, gunsmiths, and they took the ideas of watch gear works, put it in a reel so that the line could be brought in in a four to one ratio of how many times you cranked the reel. It's the first American made multiplying reel that kicked off the industry of bass fishing in America. But more importantly, you could play the fish this way. Bass fishing in Kentucky was about stream fishing in the early days. And you had to cast that, that bait out far distances to get into the eddies. And you had to get it under the tree branches, overhanging. It was very difficult. It was difficult to fly fish. So they created these bait casting reels. And uh, it's all part of the history. But over the years, it's kind of become overshadowed by the fact that the bourbon industry, the thoroughbred industry, all happened in the bluegrass region in the same, this is, we're talking about the area between the Licking River to the east, the Kentucky River to the west, and the bluegrass. All this is happening simultaneously. The story of these Kentucky reels is, well, everybody knows about the Kentucky long rifles, right? They were all made in Pennsylvania. There was a couple makers in Kentucky. But these Kentucky reels were all truly made in Kentucky. It's a great piece of history that it's kind of been lost, and the story needs to be told. Wow. Uh, it started here. 